Good afternoon, Sha. Thank you for uh, attending this talk. Give yourself a warm applause because you're in here while the weather outside is really great. Come on. It's good to be in here. Who here is from outside of Europe? Awesome. Give these people a warm, a warm applause because they traveled very far. Um, I hope that we all know that the internet um, expands outside of Europe. <laughs> um, and most people here uh, are interested in human rights. But our focus has mainly been on European issues. Um, and now we have a speaker here who is going to explain uh, human rights issues um, uh, and impacts uh, in Latin America. We have uh, Gisela, who is a uh, Mexican lawyer, uh, and she's going to talk to us about the situation in Latin America. Give it up for Gisela. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. It is indeed a super warm day, which uh, you do not get a lot of here. <laughs> so I really appreciate it. Um, yes, I am Gisela. I'm a Mexican lawyer and journalist. I specialize in freedom of speech and gender in Latin America precisely. And what I want to do today is tell you a bit of what's going on in my continent, what are the protests about, what are our biggest, uh, some of our biggest battles on the upcoming years, and more or less what's the political situation at stake right now. So it's super interesting because I've seen um, a, quite some several talks about given by women where they start apologizing, pre-apologizing, saying, oh, I do not know a lot about this topic, so if anybody wants to jump in, I am super open about that. And I am a lawyer, I am uh, coding, uh, a bit bad at it, but getting there. But then I was thinking of pre-apologizing and saying, hey, I am not technical, bear with me. But then I thought, I am technical. I can get really lawyery on you and be super technical. A doctor can be super technical. Uh, indigenous person that works with ancestral medicines can get super technical. And that led me to think, what is being technical? Is it working with technology? But then how do you define technology itself? Yesterday, a very interesting talk uh, had me thinking if body could be a technology itself. It all depends on how you define it, right? So I am technical, just a different type of technical. And um, I have four points to make. So the very first one, or rather the very first two, have to do with uh, all the myths and mythologies that probably surround European thinking around Latin Americans and our use of technology. And my very first uh, example, and my favorite one, is the Zapatistas. Uh, can I get a raise of hands if you ever heard uh, talk about the Zapatistas? Okay, that's a good share of, uh, of the crowd. So, yeah, basically the Zapatistas in Spanish is ECLN. It stands for Ejército Zapatista de Liberación Nacional. They are in, an indigenous rebel army that uh, started their uprising in the same day that NAFTA came into effect. NAFTA is the North American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, it started in 1994, and essentially there, there was a clause in NAFTA that uh, was going to override the protection of indigenous lands from privatization by the private sector, which is obviously what happened, but um, they still, the, the indigenous Zapatista army rebelled uh, and declared a war on the Mexican government with beautiful poems. So it quickly became the hotspot for leftist tourists uh, around the world. Uh, the wife of, uh, uh, the widow of François Mitterrand was there, uh, Oliver Stone. There was even a proposal by Benetton to do a campaign on the Zapatistas, which the Zapatistas, of course, being anarchists, said a big no. <laughs> and then here comes the myth. Uh, the Western media were just going crazy about it. Can you imagine? They, they, called them, they called it the Zapatur. Uh, it was super hot and trendy at the time. I was obviously five years old. Uh, I've been there uh, in the past years, but I was not there in 1994. Um, so essentially, the, this whole narrative started about how the Zapatistas were becoming cyber guerrilleros. They were doing this informational warfare, uh, throwing uh, 
these rebellious cries from the Lacandon jungle using the internet and high-tech weaponry. <laughs> uh, there's this myth that Subcomandante Marcos was using a satellite phone to communicate with cyber terrorists around the world, whatever that means. To that, Subcomandante Marcos wrote in 2013, ha, huh? really? <laughs> Come on, like, we're talking about rural Mexico here in the 90s. Uh, they barely had any electricity. Zapatistas, uh, most of them do not even speak Spanish. Do you really think Subcomandante Marcos had a super high-powered satellite phone through which he organized the whole cyber warfare? No, it was their Western collaborator collaborators that took the Zapatur that were doing that for them. Um, he then said, this is a really beautiful poem, actually. Um, I will upload it to the talk uh, description afterwards. I think it's really worth reading. It was just super long. I would have paced it all. Uh, but he then explained in 2013 how it was a nerd from Texas who started uploading all the communiques, and that's how they got uh, spread into cyberspace, right? but they did not have internet, it was not them. And when you see the pictures, it becomes really ridiculous, this narrative, which is also partly explained because 70% um, of the blogs that talk about the Zapatistas are either uh, from the US or European. So what kind of narrative won here if Mexican media and Latin American media were not even producing enough materials at the time? Of course, this explains partly because of governmental censorship and the uh, control that the Mexican government has over the press. But still, we can understand how some narratives get imposed over others. Um, so just a quick update on how, where the Zapatistas are right now. Um, at the time of the internet of the 90s, the Zapatistas were very much in tune their anarchist ideology was very much in tune with the decentralization, uh, collaborating within the media, uh, the internet as an agreement. But then as we have shifted to social networks, walled gardens, uh, private platforms, privatized uh, and proprietary software and algorithms, the Zapatistas have also changed their minds. For them now, they believe that social networks are an instrument of capitalism and that resistance cannot be um, articulated there. And they also believe we should prioritize communitary work and communitary building in a physical relationship. And I don't mean infrastructure, I mean actually touching and seeing people and talking to them and making them learn things and teaching each other. Uh, so that's where the Zapatistas are now regarding the internet. It's not, they have actually took a step back and rejected the internet principles as we know it now. So second myth, this is really good too. Um, this is Guillermo Gomez Peña. He's what we call a Chicano, uh, not in a bad sense. It's not a bad word. He's Mexican, but he lived in the United States for a long time and what he basically he has this beautiful thing that I'm going to quote directly. It, it goes like this. The mythology goes like this. We Latinos cannot handle high technology. We are caught between a pre-modern past and an imposed uh, modernism that prevents us from being anything but manual beings, artisans, not technicians. Our understanding of the world is strictly political, poetical, or at best metaphysical, but not scientific or technological whatsoever. We are uh, highly emotional, passionate creatures, meaning irrational. And when we decide to step out of our primitive zone and create high technology, we are pretty much doomed to copy what others, the Anglos and the Europeans, have done better. So we're pretty much screwed, right? This is a mythology. What I think is uh, very interesting, he wrote this at the end of uh, the 90s, it was around 1999, 2000, he was also part of the Electronic Disturbance Theater. Uh, we Latinos often feed this mythology by, re by reinstating our romantic and humanistic nature and by portraying ourselves as victims of a colonialist technology. And you will see why this is relevant in a few slides. So, as I was thinking this, I was also thinking how uh, we could do the same with gender, right? Just change the Mexicans or Latinos for women, 
Women are irrational, passionate creatures that cannot handle high technology. How's that for a stereotype? Uh, we are passionate uh, um, metaphysical beings that are made for cooking, but why would you why would you mesh with software? Why would you code? Why would you... And this is also a stereotype. This is also a mythology. Um, so very quickly, because gender is going to cut through my whole presentation, let's just agree on what gender is. Gender is all the roles, spaces, behaviors, attitudes, clothing, colors, and topics of conversation that are deemed appropriate for men and women. This means that are mean deemed appropriate if you're born with a penis or a vagina. If you're born with a penis, uh, then it's appropriate for you to wear pants uh, like blue and play with Legos when you're young. If you're born with a vagina, then they will put pink dresses on you, give you a doll so you can fit, and tell you that playing soccer is for boys. So this is essentially the social programming we get. And this construction is the gender construction, which is different from sex, which is rather biological, and it's not non-binary either, but I am not getting into that discussion right now just so we all know and are on the same page on what gender is and how it is artificially created and is not biologically determined. So, countering the myth. Um, I really dislike the digital literacy approach where the Google creator's boss just strolls in Latin America saying, come, create apps, be a web developer. I am not referring to countering the myth of Latinos not creating technology in this sense but I would rather talk about uh, technological appropriation, questioning infrastructure, questioning uh, what technology itself and how we define technology itself. It is not a neutral matter. All the power relationships that go on in the world replicate in these infrastructures and replicate online as well. Not because we have a chat, it means that everybody can express themselves equally. Minorities will still be oppressed and women will still be genderized. We cannot talk nowadays online or Twitter or Facebook about things that are outside of our gender stereotypical behavior. I will tell you a bit more about that later. But this is uh, basically uh, the concept of um, appropriating technology. So two really quick examples are uh, in Mexico, the project of Rizomatica, which is the first indigenous communitarian um, telecommunication service operating with a license, they actually got a license. In Mexico, over 50,000 communities do not have telecommunication services because it's super expensive. It's non profitable for companies to uh, set an antenna in their communities because it's sometimes over, uh, less than 3,000 people living there. So uh, Rizomatica has managed to create the technology and to teach the people so that it's the only indigenous community that actually uh, manages it. Then also in Argentina, we have uh, Nico Echanis, who has been with uh, Minimax Networks uh, creating a community of uh, Wi-Fi networks. Altermundi is the name of the project. And then I want to tell you about this one, which is definitely one of my favorites. It's autonomous feminist infrastructure. I know that for some of us here in this room, the mere word uh, feminist sometimes causes us to cringe. Uh, I would ask you to be a bit tolerant with it because it's also gendered. It's also to say that all feminists are ugly lesbians, uh, hairy, angry, <laughs> ugly lesbians. It's also a construction that has been made about dissident women. So let's just think about the term feminism once again and how it relates to infrastructure. Uh, so this is Kefir. Kefir, what I really like about this project is that it, uh, it questions the economy of um, autonomous infrastructure itself. Because basically it's based on voluntary work and donations. And you know who has time to volunteer? Mostly white men. Because t free time is a privilege. Do you think an indigenous woman that has a job and then an invisible job that is called housework, taking care of children, cooking and cleaning, which is not recognized, it's not paid, and you are expected to do it as a, as a woman anywhere in the world, but even more in certain communities that have a much more uh, set gender standards. Do you think an indigenous woman has time to volunteer for, an auto for the keeping up of the, an autonomous server or keeping up any other, administering any other uh, service? So basically, their, their discourse is about how non-binary, it means people that are not identified as men or women, 
or uh, non-diverse uh, or diverse people, non-white people, non-cis male people, have more complications getting into autonomous uh, infrastructure, autonomous technologies. I've been thinking that even free software is a privilege. Do you know how much time and knowledge it goes into making that transition? Have you ever wondered that? Or were you just born in an environment where you could do it, you could get it, and then you just assume everybody else should? Is it the most ethical thing? So. What the feminist infrastructure is worried about is actually making the shift and uh, caring for the way that people are learning to uh, take care and appropriate their own technologies. I really like this quote. We don't want to scale up, we want to keep it, keep it small in the sense of a neighborhood where everybody knows each other. So the way that um, capitalism has shaped the internet nowadays has us thinking that there's only one way of providing services, and this is massively. Because a massive service means more profit. So once again, we need to redefine technology. This is high technology. Even if it's a small autonomous server that is only working for a community, it is high technology. It doesn't mean that we have to have Facebook drones to be considered as high technology. And then, this question about digital colonialism, I have to say it's been kind of getting track in the Latin American civil society environment. I question the concept itself because, as I told you earlier, citing uh, Gomez Peña, the performance artist, I think that if we assume ourselves as victims of colonial technology, we are also... Um, vindicating the own stereotype. So my approach is rather just question the concept of technology itself and how are we defining our relationship to, to, to technology and what power is being invisibilized there. Power and voices, therefore. So um, basically the premise of the digital technology, which, uh, digi sorry, digital colonialism, which is essentially true, is that most of the world, uh, most of the internet speaks English. Here's the 2017 statistics, it's true. English, Chinese, and then Spanish. And because of this, the content created by the people in the Global South is much less, which opens up a lot of discussions, right? Because then if, uh, say, the history of Latin America in Wikipedia was created, uh, well, this is the uh, freebase graph. The Wikipedia one is not that good, it's a bit crooked. But the argument is that there are more Wikipedia articles inside of this circle than outside of it. This is Europe. And as you can see, the other, all the other parts of the world are not, the, the knowledge is not being as produced in the global south. This one as well, this is the IP before utilization in, uh, I, I believe this is 2016. And this for me is shocking. We have content in English created by the global north. In terms of archival, archival processes, this is quite complicated because then it means that we get historical narratives from the global north. Uh, search algorithms, I'm super worried about that. Proprietary search algorithms that are also secret, we don't know how they prioritize information and we don't know how Google, for example, decides not to index something. Why? Why would they not index something and we don't even know about it? It's the biggest and most monopolistic search engine in the world. Should there be any kind of accountability for this? And then, of course, the bomb of our day, copyright. Um, so basically, the fight of copyright, I could talk for hours about this, I will not. Uh, <laughs> but basically, via the flexibilization of patents uh, and the harshening of copyright norms in favor of multinationals. And this is why NAFTA is going to be a big issue right now. The free trade agreement, uh, the one that the Zapatistas rebelled against in 94 is being renegotiated as we speak by at least two morons. My president, Enrique Peña Nieto, that cannot even mention three books that he has read at a book fair, and do not get, even get me started about Trump. I, I cannot talk about that right now. <laughs> but copyright uh, provisions being lobbied by big multinationals are going to get in uh, uh, into NAFTA. How are we going to push back and what are we going to do about it? Because that's going to change the whole ecosystem of the internet. So, third, let's take a quick glimpse at Latin America. We have our own problems and we have our own solutions for them. Just because you went backpacking to Latin America for two months does not mean you're Che Guevara or you understand the reality of the, content, the continent. Guess what? We are not even a continent, we're different countries. Stop calling us the developing 
country, we're not a country, there's a lot of them. There's not an homogeneous reality, we cannot even agree amongst ourselves. So let's drop the Che Guevara fetishization as well. <laughs> Uh, just uh, quick statistics, um, we have around almost 60% of internet uh, penetration rate compared to Europe and North America is quite uh, a bit. Mexico is included in the North America one, by the way, so that might shift um, percentages a bit as well. And uh, one of the projects that was done, um, who here knows Facebook Free Basics? Do you know what I'm... Okay. So basically, uh, free, basics is, uh, free Basics was about not charging for Facebook data. And it was beautiful because Global Voices just published a study about how it was a big fail. Because it's digital colonialism. They do not take into account the local language of the population. Um, all you get is ads from the UK and US, in the case of Mexico, from one of the most uh, rich men in the world, which is Mexican. And, um, well, it's not the internet, it's just Facebook and some of their crappy services. So why would that be a solution for the lack of connectivity? The answer is, it's not. And then, hashtags everywhere. <laughs> How, uh, despite these platforms being evil or having their own uh, rules, the walled gardens, they have been useful, and we have to acknowledge that, for a political organization. This is the uh, Yo Soy 132, I am 132. It's the, one of the first and most important social movements created by a hashtag and a trending topic in Mexico. And that spread through Latin America in the coming years. Um, it was against who, the Moron, who is now a president. Uh, he was a candidate back then. Uh, and the creation of trending topics is crucial because in countries where you have media being manipulated by the government, then trending topics are a very effective way of counter-narrative. Then uh, take the street against corruption in Peru. Ya me cansé. This is... Uh, <laughs> so the, state, the Mexican state disappeared 43 students, uh, for 43 anarchists, indigenous students. And what the DA's uh, office, the police, said, oh, I'm tired of looking for them. We, could just, we just cannot find them. I'm tired. So we made a hashtag saying, hashtag, I am tired, reappropriating the hashtag. It took a lot of people out on the streets. And this was actually the first uh, regional movement with a lot of solidarity with a lot of causes, because we're talking about forced disappearance. And we're talking about media not talking about forced disappearances. So then how do you get past that informational uh, gatekeeping? Definitely Twitter was uh, a big tool at the time. Pyrowebs against the metadata retention in Paraguay. Then uh, Guatemala, with uh, Quit Now, they kicked out their president who was presumably involved in the Mayan genocide in Guatemala and also killed one of the opposition leaders. And Fora Temer. Temer is the now president of Brazil that made a coup d'etat against Dilma Rousseff, which was one of the first Latin American female presidents in uh, the continent. She was uh, in Brazil. The downsides of protesting in these platforms are the Twitter bots, uh, the, how they, they are behaving, I'm calling it the Latin American fake news, just because this term is super trendy right now, even though I do not agree with it. And then, uh, of course, the private censorship that goes on in the platform. So basically, uh, the government, uh, especially in Mexico, has been documented, in Ecuador and Venezuela as well, which are three super hot political spots right now. In Mexico, what the, what the Mexican government does is have a lot of uh, bot accounts to uh, repress hashtags and prevent political organization. How they do this is that they coordinate spamming through all these different bot accounts that through the years they have become really sophisticated. They are not as hard to catch as they were before. So when spamming the hashtag, the Twitter algorithm, the algorithm just takes it down from the trending topics, thus um, disabling political organization and in, impeding us through the actual creation of counter narratives. Uh, we know what to do with propaganda, right? You just burn it or something. You know how to deal with, pro it's been around forever, political propaganda. But what do you do when you effectively have what it looks like a cyber riot police around your Twitter conversation? How are you going to fight that if we're talking about private platforms, proprietary algorithms, and just a Silicon Valley company that is not that sensitive to these kinds of topics because they do need to get spam out? 
So these are the questions that we're facing nowadays. Would the answer be, oh, just go and get organized in your own autonomous platform? How would we teach people to do that? What would be the learning curve and how could we effectively organize if we do in such a platform? Um, this might be a matter of life and death. Uh, it's, not, um, it's not that light. Uh, Rompe el miedo means do not be afraid. The repression of protests was so much in Mexico at one point that people stopped protesting. It's a chilling effect. You silence yourself, you self-censor yourself. So we made this hashtag where we essentially monitored where the cops were coming from so we could effectively run away from them. So we had people monitoring, telling us where the uh, greatest exits were. And so then if the government spams that, you get detained, you get taken into the special unit for crime organization, for criminal organizations, because of course protesting is a crime, and then protesting with more than five people is organized crime. And then, well, you just open that door in the Mexican judicial system, right? Um, gender has also been super active through hashtags. Um, my first harassment especially was a very big uh, hashtag through all Latin America. Women want to be alive and women lives matter was more or less that. We got a lot of, oh, all lives matter too. It's like, yes, dude, but you have two houses. One is burning down, and the other one is not burning down, and you're putting out the fire in the one that is not burning down. <laughs> Just give the fire hose to the people that actually need it, no? So it was complicated like that. Offline, uh, the femicide rate in Latin America is very big. At least uh, 1,678 women were killed because of gender-based crimes, which means essentially gender hate. Uh, it's really hard for me to talk about this because I've been close to it in um, several investigations and occasions, but it's just bodies that are treated like nothing. Uh, in Ecatepec, one of the most dangerous uh, sites in Mexico, to be a woman, uh, we found eight female bodies dumped in a sewage in a trash bag. So when we talk about online gender violence, we have to know that the internet is not an isolated reality, but that it's also connected to this uh, offline violence and machista violence that does exist. Abortion, a basic reproductive right, is still prohibited in Chile, Salvador, Nicaragua, Honduras, Haiti, and Suriname. And not only that, but if you are a pro-abortion activist, because you're not supposed to be a pro-abortion activist, you will probably get a lot of uh, gender hate on your social networks. If you're a feminist, if you're a... I have friends that are um, anchor women for, for Fox Sports, and they get so many death and rape threats because women are not supposed to talk about sports because women look better when they shut up, because you are, go back to the kitchen. That's the insult that they get the most, go back to the kitchen. Why, that doesn't, is the kitchen my place? Should I not be speaking about politics or sports because it's not gender appropriate? And the online violence that they get, it's part of the social norm to perpetuate gender standards. So no, the internet is definitely now not a safe place, at least not from where I see it. Very quickly, um, what um, my first harassment hashtag allowed us to actually do was visibilize and talk about topics that were not, uh, that were taboo before. It was just about saying when you were first harassed. Uh, you cannot see this graph this well, but this is 18 years old, and this is 10 years old, and this is five years old. So most women in Mexico, uh, and this was Mexico and Central America, get harassed the first time when they are between five and ten years old. We're basically talking about child abuse here. This was a very good campaign because through hashtags we could actually get all that information and start making network analysis and talk and uh, make people more conscious uh, about this topic and also break the taboo. If you're a woman and you have been harassed, it's okay to tell your story. It's not your fault. It was not you. You can speak up. It's fine. It was a very beautiful uh, and very emotive uh, social network millennial moment. Uh, then the downsides, of course, on the other side is all these uh, platforms censoring uh, politically relevant and politically protected content via their terms and conditions. Like this picture, we know Facebook censors nipples. They censor nipples because our female nipples are connected to a reproductive function, and because they are connected to a reproductive function, they are deemed as erotic socially. 
because your guy's nipples are not connected to a reproductive function, then they are not. So that's the stupid reason why Facebook censors nipples. It's either algorithmic or it's their content managers. We have no fucking clue because, of course, the algorithm is secret. So black women protesting. This is obscene for Facebook. They took it down. So then the question about the feminist infrastructure come back, comes back up. Can we resist on the same platforms that are effectively colonizing us? And well, uh, Instagram uh, on shaving bikini lines needs to be censored somehow. Because sure, women need to be perfectly well shaved, right? We guys can be hairy, women have to be shaved. That's gender, again. It's definitely not biological. We're all born with hair. So. Super quickly, um, let me go through this <laughs> surveillance scenario, which is also not very good. I'm sorry, I hope I don't depress you. <laughs> but um, this is an investigation I made in 2015 about hacking team. Uh, we all, I, I'm going to assume we all know uh, the hacking team thing, this Italian malware company that sold Galileo, and they got hacked by Finesse Fisher in 2015. Uh, as you can see in this map, almost all Latin America either bought malware from Hacking Team or was negotiating with Hacking Team when they got hacked and they couldn't go through the purchase, um, which is worrisome for two reasons. First, because we have authoritarian governments buying malware with no regulation. And then we have, regulated, uh, we have uh, malware that is being used in the framework of the laws that were valid in dictatorships. So dictatorial laws for surveillance now being used with a super, super invasive malware. How would that go wrong? How can that go wrong? Can, can somebody please tell me? So uh, the biggest client of hacking team, again, in the world, was Mexico, buying almost uh, 6 million euros. Um, then we have Brazil, but uh, quite a bit as well. And what was concerning here, well, it was Brazil, uh, Colombia, Ecuador, Honduras, and Chile. What was very concerning here was that um, in Mexico it was used to spy against activists and political opponents. In Ecuador it was used to spy against political opponents. And because of the hacking team emails, we knew that the DEA effectively intercepted all internet communications of Colombians, which was quite a scandal by itself. It got lost within all the hacking team false emails, but I think it says a lot also about US intervention in Latin America still nowadays. Uh, then we have uh, PACRAT, which is uh, one of the first proven examples of ideologically directed malware, because PACRAT, uh, this study published by Citizen Lab showed how it was targeted against uh, communist countries, except for Brazil. The rest of the countries that, uh, where PACRAT was detected were um, the communist allegiance, uh, the Bolivarian allegiance in Latin America. And then we get to the um, bad guys, I think, of the year. Um, NSO Group sold $250 million to the Mexican government worth of Pegasus, uh, this malware that uh, it's also uh, remote control malware. And it was used against the fiercest critics of the president. The female journalist, that uncovered the biggest corruption scandal, the White House. Her kid, because she was smart enough not to click on the phishing links that uh, NS, the, the Pegasus malware sent uh, to her to get infected. Um, it was used against uh, the lawyers that are litigating the disappearance of the 43 in the entire American court and against anti-corruption activists. And then we knew they were used against um, government opposition and some more journalists and some more lawyers. Ah, and also there was a special commission that was investigating the disappearance of the 43, a special international commission. They got spied on also with Pegasus. Uh, approximately each piece of malware costs $1 million. So it's a very expensive piece of malware that is supposedly being used for national security reasons. But obviously this shows what the abuses of malware are. So if there's any malware development uh, developers in the room, just think about how this technology is being used in other places with the pretext of preventing crime, terrorism, or the Chapo Guzman escaping from jail again. 
Um, well, this is just a cool project, this uh, Protestos by Article 19 and Coding Rights, which was a response to counter surveillance, a protesting surveillance. Um, just like some tips on what you can do, you can cover your face, some legal advice, uh, take care with what you post, encrypt, etc. So, essentially, um, Yes, we have our own problems, but we have our own solutions as well. It does not necessarily mean that um, we are idiots or we cannot do technology ourselves, as I already said. Uh, I went through the myths of the Zapatistas, I went through the myth and mythology of how Latinos and us women cannot create technology. And I've been, I, take, I retake what the latest poem of the Zapatistas on the internet is. Um, well, first of all, there is not one internet. Let me just be clear about that. The internets are a lot. And they are connected to geopolitical realities as well. And as I was saying, it's not a neutral space, not just because you have a chat or a platform or a mailing list. It means that everybody can express themselves equally because power relationships are being replicated. Gender, class, and race relationships are being replicated. So essentially, the question of the Zapatistas is, is the internet still a space of dispute and struggle, or have we completely lost that battle? What can we do now here from our privilege to keep uh, feeding a more open and diverse uh, space. So, four, four and a half things, <laughs> maybe five. First, do not appropriate our narratives. No, just because you went to an Encuentro Zapatista once does not mean that you know what you're talking about. We are not just emotional and irrational people. It would be super nice to have that acknowledged every once in a while. Um, be self-conscious about your privilege. Having time to volunteer is a privilege. Do not judge people that do not have it. Take a pause and think about diversity in your own work environment. Pause and think how you can get more women in your hack spaces. Pause and think what you are doing to effectively silence minority voices online or offline. Are you trolling the woman? Are you the troll that is trolling the woman? Are you the troll that is trolling the Indian guy at the uh, tent next door? Let's be conscious about our privilege. This is definitely the first step, online or offline. Recognize that we might have some solutions for uh, our community problems. It's not only a one-way street. It's not only what is done in Europe, what should be copied, because a lot of things are not working here. We might have creative solutions for that. And finally, ask questions before telling us what to do. Or the famous mansplaining. Um, I have to say I've been getting it quite a lot here at, at SHA. <laughs> but don't assume that you are right just because you are right. Ask questions first. Get to know the other person. Let's intersect. Let's touch each other more. Recognize that gender, class, and race are a real problem outside of this bubble. Let's make this a real conversation. We all want a more diverse, equal, and open internet for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gisela. Do we have any questions? We have some time for questions. I won't bite, I promise. I was a bit harsh on you at the end. <laughs> All right, let's thank Isela again. Thank you.